Hi, welcome to my series on the fall of Anne Boleyn and the events that led up to the tragic execution of Queen Anne Boleyn on the 19th of May 1536. If you're new to these videos, since the 24th of April, I've been giving a day-by-day -day account of the events leading up to the execution, just so you can see how quickly everything happened. By the way, I'm Claire Ridgway. I'm the author of The Fall of Anne Boleyn, a countdown which goes into far more detail on Anne's fall and also the people involved in it. I've also written several other Tudor history books and I run the Anne Boleyn Files and Tudor Society websites. Okay, on this day in 1536, which was a Sunday, Sunday the 14th of May, just 12 days after the arrest of Queen Anne Boleyn, who'd been arrested at Greenwich Palace and taken to um, the Tower of London to be imprisoned there. And just a day before her trial for high treason, King Henry VIII, of course Anne's husband, sent Sir Nicholas Carew to collect the king's sweetheart, Jane Seymour, um, who'd been sent to Carew's country home, and to bring her back to London, to bring her to Chelsea. Jane, who'd served as one of Queen Anne's ladies, had been sent to Carew's country home to get her away from court to prevent gossip about the king's relationship with her, of course, in relation to, you know, Anne Boleyn's fall. However, now that the investigation was kind of nearing an end, the king thought it appropriate to bring her back into London, to bring her closer to him. And the property at Chelsea where she was to be kept was very close to him, being within a mile of his lodgings, which meant that it was very easy for him to get together with her now. At Chelsea, Jane was treated as queen. Eustace Chapuis, who of course uh, was the imperial ambassador, um, who is a fantastic uh, resource and, and source for the events of 1536 because his dispatches are so detailed. He described in a dispatch how Jane was most richly dressed and splendidly served by the king's cook and other officers. It makes you wonder, well it makes me wonder anyway, what Jane thought of it all and how much she was aware of what was going on. You know, what was the king telling her? She must have known surely that her predecessor was in the Tower of London, but how much did she know about the investigation? Investigation in inverted commas really. Interestingly, I do find this interesting, Chapuis was not that impressed with the woman who was replacing the Queen in the King's affections um, and replacing the woman, Anne Boleyn, that uh, Chapuis had no time for and who he had referred to as the concubine. Um, you'd think that um, he might be quite flattering towards someone that was going to be replacing her, but, but no, he was not that impressed with her. In a later dispatch on the 18th of May 1536, he described Jane as of middle stature and no great beauty, so fair that one would call her rather pale than otherwise. He also said that she was inclined to be proud and haughty and that he doubted that she was a virgin and that she was not a woman of great wit. So not the most flattering of descriptions, however there was a plus point, there was an advantage. He thought that she did bear great love and reverence to the Princess Mary. So that was a plus point in Jane's favour. He, she may not be a virgin, she may be, she hasn't got much wit or anything, but at least she might be on the Princess Mary's side. Now, as an aside, Jane is often given credit 
for bringing uh, Henry VIII's family back together and being kind to Mary and acting uh, as a mediator between Mary and Henry VIII. That is actually a myth, it's a fallacy, it's, it's yeah, not true. Um, Jane did welcome Mary back to court. At the same time, Henry VIII welcomed her back to court. Um, Mary's ill treatment at the hands of King Henry VIII actually got worse after Anne Boleyn's um, execution. It had been easy for Mary to blame her stepmother Anne Boleyn for her ill treatment, but we have to remember that King Henry VIII was in charge and may have supported it and may have encouraged him at times, but it was down to him. His daughter Mary was being disobedient and defiant in his eyes. Um, she'd refused to submit to him to recognise the annulment of her parents' marriage. She'd refused to recognise him as supreme head of the church. So she had to suffer and with threats, with bullying. And it was only, in fact, Shahwi needs to be given the credit for Mary coming back to court and being welcomed back by her father, because it was Shahwi who was concerned about Mary's health. And he also felt that she might be executed. So he managed to persuade her to submit to her father. Don't read what you're signing, you know, Mary, just sign it and it will be fine. The Pope says it will be fine. Uh, he had to really convince her and she did sign the oath. She did submit to her father and at that point Henry VIII was, oh lovely daughter, come back to court. You know, he went from being the father that bullied her and sent members of his council to threaten her to, you know, welcoming her back at court and once again being her loving father because now she was plain born and she was a dutiful daughter. It was because Mary submitted that she came back to court. It was nothing that Jane Seymour did. So let's put that to bed. Also on this day in 1536, so let's go back to the 14th of May, 1536, Thomas Cromwell, who was King Henry VIII's right-hand man and the man in charge of the investigation into Queen Anne Boleyn, wrote to Stephen Gardner and Sir John Wallop, who were Henry VIII's ambassadors at the French court, to update them on things in London, the situation in London. In this letter, he wrote of the Queen's incontinent living, which was so rank and common that the ladies of her privy chamber could not conceal it. So shocking news there. He also said that the crimes of the Queen and the five men were so abominable that he thought the like was never heard. It was shocking news for these ambassadors and Cromwell was putting it in very shocking language. I'll give you a link to read Thomas Cromwell's letter to these ambassadors so you can just read what he was saying. But, you know, incontinent living, it was so rank. Um, it was abominable. It's very much like the language is used in the indictment. It's shocking languages. This, this queen was just the worst that ever could be, really. Um, so that's what he was saying about Queen Anne Boleyn on this day in 1536. We are, of course, just five days away from her execution now. I do hope you're finding the information that I'm sharing in these videos helpful and that it's giving you an insight into Anne's fall and just how quickly it happened. As I said a few days ago, it really just brings home to me every year just how quickly things uh, you know, went for Anne Boleyn from one moment being you know, the, the Queen and and having people's love and respect to being on that scaffold and being accused of incest and adultery and plotting to kill your husband the king. Just awful. You can subscribe to my channel which has lots of Tudor history goodies for you, lots to uh, give you your Tudor fix uh, by clicking around about there. Hit the bell to be notified of new videos as they go live and uh, yeah, uh, give me a like if you've enjoyed this video, that would be great. See you tomorrow, take care, bye bye. <laughs>